Okay, well, let me welcome everybody to this first of our month webinars. We are going to present these webinars uh, quarterly and hopefully on topics that will be of uh, interest uh, across the, uh, the month program it itself. We are uh, broadcasting uh, out to the world and let me welcome all the people that are at remote sites uh, via Adobe Connect. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. For people in the room, if you would like to ask a question, we'd like you in the first three rows, there's the speakers here. If you would turn yourself on, ask the question so that uh, people out in the rest of the world can hear the question. People in the back will repeat your questions. For those that are uh, at a distant location, uh, we would like you to tap, uh, type in your questions into the chat box and we will stop periodically and take your questions. So uh, let's go ahead and start. Maybe. I am. Um, well, let's, let's do this one. The arrow. Let me do that one. There we go. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, the t I'm David Moak. I'm a professor of geology at Montana State University. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Rajiv Avji, is a professor of physics here at Montana State and is director of the Imaging and Chemical Analysis Lab. Today we'd like to give kind of an overview of some of the work we're doing in the ICAL lab uh, on material characterization. We'd like to give you just a sampling of the methods that we use, including scanning electron microscopy, uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and Auger electron spectroscopy. So let's um, get right into it. Uh, first of all, this is a project supported by the National Science Foundation. We are very, very appreciative of the support. Montana State University was awarded one of the 16 regional centers for the uh, NMCI program, uh, the, excuse me, the National Nanotechnology Coordinated uh, Infrastructure. And I just want to emphasize this box on the bottom just very briefly. The NMCI sites will provide researchers from academia, government, and companies, large and small, with access to university user facilities with leading edge fabrication and characterization tools, instrumentation and expertise within all the disciplines of nanoscale science, engineering, and technology. So this is an introduction and an invitation uh, to people from across uh, the engineering disciplines, the physical sciences, earth and environmental science, life sciences, uh, to be involved with this uh, nanoscience technology. The Mont vision, our particular uh, vision is to promote nanotechnology uh, discovery, education, and outreach by providing access to shared use instruments, expert training on their safe and effective use, and broad-based education about nanoscale science, and technology for teachers and learners at all levels who come from diverse communities. So we anticipate supporting everything from uh, K-12 uh, classroom de demonstrations to in-class uh, projects here on campus and uh, support of independent study projects by undergrads and graduate students alike. We welcome users uh, from the world to come uh, join us here uh, program. And particularly, uh, we're interested in building relations with our uh, uh, corporate uh, colleagues uh, who are involved with uh, any number of nanoscience projects. The Mont core facilities include uh, the Imaging and Chemical Analysis Laboratory. That will be the focus of today's uh, talk. But we also have the Montana Microfabrication Facility, the Center for Biofilm Engineering, the Center for Bio-Inspired Nanomaterials, and then the Metabolomics, uh, Proteomics, and Mass Spectroscopy Facility. And in future webinars, we'll be doing uh, showcases on e each of these facilities. Oh. Now, I want to say just a word about characterization. And the question here is, what do you need to know about the particles or the materials that you're looking at? Well, here's a partial list. Some of the things that you may want to know are, first of all, what is the bulk material that you're looking at? So we're talking about phase identification here. 
uh, at the most uh, fundamental primary level. You might want to know about the bulk composition of the materials and the variations. Are your samples homogeneous or are they heterogeneous? Is there compositional zoning? Are there contaminants, trace element contaminants that, that we can be looking for? What's the structure of the material? Uh, and here I'm talking about the atomic structure. In some cases, we might be looking at the bulk structure in terms of the three-dimensional lattice that we're looking at. In other cases, we might be looking at surface structures uh, as well. I'm a geologist. I, I care an awful lot about the morphology and shape and distribution of phases in, in a matrix. But in addition, uh, we might be interested in textures between different types of grains. Uh, are there intergrowths or overgrowths? Is there epitaxy? And these types of textual relations quite often give us temporal relations related to uh, the history of reactions that, that might be occurring, either in natural or engineered uh, systems. We might care about the crystallographic orientation. Um, and uh, this could either be due to lattice orientation or to the orientation of the grain shapes themselves. You might want to do a chemical stratigraphy and look across the interface between a material and its uh, external environment. Is there a chemical stratigraphy that has uh, uh, occurred due to a variety of chemical reactions? You might want to know what the surface composition is. And I'm making a distinction here. What is the elemental uh, abundances uh, of material stuck on the surface, maybe due to catalysis? or maybe redox reactions, or maybe absorption reactions. And you might care about the chemical state. There are quite often orders of magnitude uh, differences in the oxidation state between the material and its surrounding environment. And you might care about, do we have arsenic-3 versus ar arsenic-5? And then uh, scale is always a, a question. To characterize a material, you might want to characterize it on numerous scales, from the nanoscale up to the mesoscale. And the question I would ask here is, when do surface energies become important with respect to the bulk? So uh, I'm just not doing very well with the clicker. There we go. So um, I'm going to give you the conclusion now, and we'll give it to you again. But there's really four take-home points uh, to this talk. And the first is we have to very clearly define a research question because the nature of the question that you're asking is going to very strongly influence your sample selection, the sample preparation methods that you use. These, these are absolutely critical. 90% of the work in our lab actually is in the sample preparation before we get to the instruments. And then also the sequence of procedures must be planned very carefully. In some cases, uh, our surface sensitive spectroscopies uh, will not allow us to coat a sample. If you coat with carbon or iridium or gold, that's what you're going to see in surface spectroscopies. So we have to do it in the right order. The other thing, the second major point is the right tool for the right job. We really want to impress on uh, all of our users that you really need to know the capabilities and limitations of each of the instruments. And this also requires knowing the fundamentals. And that's part of what we're going to do today is present a little bit of the fundamentals and then some of the practical applications. We want to emphasize that multiple lines of evidence are needed, and you really want that confirmatory uh, evidence using multiple uh, ways of interrogating your sample. In some cases, uh, this will be integrating both imaging, chemical imaging, and physical imaging, along with spectroscopy, and we'll show you examples of that. And then finally, expect the unexpected. People come to our lab all the time saying, I know what this is, but I'll just take a quick look. And it turns out that the surfaces of materials quite often are hugely different compared with, with the bulk samples. So be open, because there are uh, strange things that may be revealed. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton uh, to my colleague, Dr. Recha Pavci, who will uh, just to set up uh, the, the rest of uh, the show, we're going to use biocorrosion as an example. But we're going to show you from a number of different points of view, using a number of different instruments, how we might uh, look at those samples. So just think about this in terms of how you might use these techniques on your own material. Thank Director. you. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Thank you. And good morning to some of you from, from here to west, and good afternoon to the rest. And the, um, 
Let me just uh, talk a little bit about iCal. It's a user facility for basic and applied research education in all uh, science and engineering uh, departments in MSU and outside MSU. We have a large group of people coming from industry, from other government labs. Essentially, now the school is, you think it's closed, but you go to ICAL, it's always busy. It's open 24-7. You know, we, if you gain our confidence, we will give you uh, a passcode, and then you can use the systems anytime you want. Many times I would come there, go there like 1 o'clock in the morning, don't ask me why I'm there at that hour, and I see people using it. So we have a um, um, number of um, instrumentation. Uh, we have two scanning electron microscopes, powder X-ray diffraction system, and time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry. And we have X-ray photo electron spectroscopy, atomic force microscopes, a couple of them. We have just as I speak, it's being called scanning Auger nanoprobe probe. It's a unique system. I will tell you its capabilities uh, uh, during my talk. And we have optical microscope, if, uh, you know, but there is a spectacular op optical microscope facility in, in the Center for Biofilm Engineering. So um, basic uh, activities uh, we have in ICAL, you know, we essentially serve everybody in the university and outside the university, like 20 departments and centers, 24 Montana companies, 16 non-MSU academic institutions, government labs like INL, INEL sometimes it's uh, called. We work with them almost, um, you know, um, you know, monthly. And uh, we interact with students. You know, we have lots of demonstrations as well as teaching. You know, Dave spent lots of, you know, weeks in teaching um, his classes there. And we do a lot of short courses. And short courses, one and one. So when, when you really finish our short courses, typically about nine, ten hours, you really learn the system. That's how you gain our confidence. And we give you the code, and you can, uh, you can, uh, you can use the system anytime you want. So iCal is your other laboratory. Don't forget that. So we do um, in-house in research, and we've been fairly successful years. And in connection with that, our focus is time dependent. Depends on where we got the money. Recently, we are in involved in bi bacterial immobilization, biocorrosion, biodegradation of fuels, single cell manipulation, things of that nature. These are all fun stuff. So um, now, today's focus essentially is uh, Scanning electron microscope application of scanning electron microscopy, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and a little bit of scanning Auger nanoprobe in characterizing fairly complicated samples. I tell you, corrosion is in no joke. Uh, it is like a crime scene. You really go there and then start digging in the evidence and try to reconstruct the crime, essentially how this happened. So these are our two scanning electron microscopes. The one on the right here, just follow my arrow, the ones that they are away, is the, our field emission scanning electron microscope. The one on the left is standard electron microscope, but it's a very decorated electron microscope. It has cryo stage attached to it, fully functioning cryo stage, and every port is, has some detector on it. You know, it could be EDX, detector, it could be cathode luminescence, it could be another EDX, which is path mapping, and things of that nature. So, so this is our scanning electron microscope corner. Let us not worry about how a scanning electron microscope works. Let's just assume that electrons are created right here. There's this complicated optics, electron optics, and it focuses the beam on your target. That's all you have to know about the electron microscope. You got a focused beam about a one nanometer diameter. So our job is to see how it interacts, what you can get from that beam in terms of data. This is probably one of the most important uh, uh, message that I will give. So it's a bit complicated, but just uh, stay with me. So this is a monoenergetic beam. Say it's 20 keV electron beam generated by the microscope, focused to a one nanometer spot and interacting with a target right here. You know, don't take one nanometer for granted. It's a very small thing. 
it's the 10 angstrom. You know, it's a couple atoms, uh, two or three atoms, well, maybe uh, five atoms wide, but nevertheless, it's a very small. When it interacts with the surface here, your data is coming on the right side. So you get out a bunch of electrons, like I, I show here, from zero kinetic energy, you see this one, all the way to 20 keV, assuming that it was 20 keV we shoot in. You also get x-rays. So depends on what kind of detectors you have on the right side here, that's your information. That's the sophistication. That's where the nano that I'm talking about comes in. What you add on the right side determines what you get. So X-ray, if you have an X-ray detector, you get what we call, ED, call EDX, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, micro X-ray analysis. It's not nano, it's micro. I would like to emphasize that. X-ray analysis, micro, no matter what the size of your beam is. It comes from a volume here, I will tell you in a minute, about several micron wide, even though your beam is one nanometer. And then you have what we call these secondary electrons. You use electrons between 50 to 100 EV to do this spectacular images in the, uh, uh, in the uh, scanning electron microscope. It looks like a three-dimension. There's a reason for it. Physicists chose these electrons because their penetration depth are the minimum. They cannot come very deep from the surface. So every time uh, an electron between 50 and 100 EV comes, it comes from the very top layer of your material. This means you don't have to have a little aperture. You don't have to worry about the depth of field. It's guaranteed by the nature of the electrons you choose. So these electrons are used to do imaging. Now, between 0 to 2,000 EV, there are these what we call Auger electrons. They ride on a very big background. They look like a little blip. You wonder how the hell that could be such an expensive one and a half billion dollar system that what information can I get from something like that? Believe me. If you look at a little blip on a big background, you don't see much. But if you take a derivative of it, it shines like a Christmas tree. That's the trick in the OJ. They take derivatives of this background and they get the signal. These OJ electrons run from 0 to 2,000 EV, cover all periodic tables. And they give you information from the first a couple of nanometers of the surface. X-rays, let's imagine a science fiction scenario um, you know, some uh, space people look in the Earth, they see these roads, and they see these red lines on the roads, and they use X-ray analysis, they see the rocks under the road. But when they do OJ, they can tell that red spot on the road is either a paint or a tomato paste. This is what I am talking about, surface versus bulk. I would like to leave you with that message. So, you know, uh, so you take a X-ray data, you see something like that. I'll get back to that thing in the next slide, in a bit, in a bit maybe in the next after this. But let me just talk a little bit about the bulk versus surface analysis. This is the incoming beam entering your material right here, about a couple of nanometers at best. It's a very tiny spot. When it goes in to the solid, let's assume it's a 20 keV beam. It's ricocheting. It's just going back and forth, scattering and scattering. And every time it scatters, it produces either an X-ray or an electron. If the electron is produced near the surface, it would be an OJ electron or the second electron. We use them either for imaging, for uh, elemental. So this is the interaction volume, excitation volume, essentially. Information, so X-rays can penetrate deep. So X-rays can come out of here. It will tell you information about the bulk inside. One micron is 10,000 you know, 10, angstrom, 1,000 nanometers. It's a huge distance as compared to the surface. And this, this is a one nanometer wide uh, beam. And this is you know, a couple thousand times bigger than that. So in reality, this should have been a huge, you know, if I do things scale. So really, I like you, most people think one micron is a surface wrong. One atom is surface. That's when we, when we say the surface sensitive, I'm talking about one atom thick. So, so x-rays are telling what's happening under the surface. 
Auger electrons are telling what's happening on the surface. And this nano Auger system that we just got will have all of these in one system at the same time. We'll talk more about So let's just uh, have some housekeeping. Uh, let me just put the other one here. Uh, so sometimes you, you may hear that, well, X-rays are K-alpha X-rays, K-beta X-rays, all these kind of names. Well, we have to have a common language so we can understand each other. So K lines associated with N equal 1 quantum number. L lines associated with N equal 2. And, you know, why do, why do they choose KLM? Why not A, B, C, D? I don't know. But this is how the uh, convention is. So any electron that is ejected from the core level, say here in the K shell, nature is very, very efficient. It doesn't sit in that configuration. It immediately adjusts within 10 to the minus, uh, you know, 10 seconds, fills this hole. So if this electron is filled by the L elect shell electron, it's called called the K shell X-ray. So, so you can see each X-ray peak has K alpha X-rays, so it's the iron K alpha and the iron K beta. That is because some of these holes are filled by the M shell. So those are, these are the F beta. And similar like chromium K alpha, chromium K beta. So every time when you see a peak, don't get satisfied with it. You have to look at the other partner making sure that it's the right identification. Many times I've seen people identifying peaks they don't look for the others. Every time peaks come in, in, a, in, a, in a pattern, watch for the pattern. So as they alluded to this, uh, I will now show you multi-technique approach in analysis of a complicated, really, really complicated uh, surfaces, a corroded material in this case. And in fact, the bio-corroded material, there are bacteria, there are minerals. I mean, you cannot have it more complicated than that. And so, so I will, sometimes I will switch between techniques, so don't get, don't get confused. I'm looking at the same thing with different techniques. They give complementary information. With field emission, I call it FEM uh, microscope, I can show, I can see the morphology, I can see the X-ray analysis, I can even get structure analysis using electron backscatter diffraction. With XPS, I can get composition, chemistry, ionic structure. Is it copper 2 or copper 0? Is it elemental copper or, 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 or uh, oxidized copper? Or same thing with iron or sulfur, whatever. With nano -J, this is, as I said, it's just being installed. Actually, this system can do all of this and some. But you can also do composition at nanoscale, truly nanoscale, both image and spectral resolution within four nanometer accuracy. Depth profiling, you know, we have a very sophisticated $150,000 argon gun that is extremely sophisticated. We can do surface sensitive analysis. So they are all, uh, so some of you may have seen this graph before, but let's start with a clean surface. Let's work with iron. Iron is our structural material. Without iron, modern life would not have existed. You know, your bridges, your buildings, your cars, everything. It's mostly this particular steel. It's called a carbon steel. It's an alloy of carbon and the iron. Um, in fact, you have about, this is called the 1018 steel. Most of this iron they use in the construction engine, something like this, or the pipes. They carry your fuel from Alaska to wherever. They're all carbon steel. And, the, um, and when you look at it, when you shine it, when you, you know, sputter it, just, just bring, the, uh, uh, bring the shiny surface into the focus, what you see here is the grains of pure iron. This is essentially, uh, there's a carbon in it, but carbon is not inside the, um, the pure iron. So carbon is locked into this, what we call perlite phases. These perlites are made up, it's a layer, one layer of cementite, which is the carbide, iron carbide, Fe3C, another layer of the same material here is a ferret, you know, it's a body cement cubic iron, but and then there's another layer, they're sub-micron thick. So one layer of that, next layer of that, is highly strained. Iron doesn't like to be in a prison like that. So the iron in this perlite structure is different from the iron there in this treasured grains because it's just a standard body-centered cubic structure. So it will play important role 
in how these materials degrade. There are grain boundaries between different grains. There are different orientations. We can, we can show you what orientation. There are these little dots here you see. They are, they are imperfections. They are manganese sulfide in cushion. I mean, this can apply to any material. Bring me an aluminum, bring me a titanium, whatever. So this is a general thing. Don't just say you can only do it for iron. And this, they look, this innocent looking uh, manganese sulfide inclusions are not too innocent. Because of them, you have pits. They are starting at micro and nanoscale, and they become macro scale, and your pipes are corroded. Here is an example. So you have a bar, it's a long bar. This is, this is you know, rolled through a mill. So this is called a rolling direction. So you can polish it perpendicular to it. That's, that's the previous picture I, I, I show another version of it here. So you can see manganese sulfide, tips of manganese sulfide inclusions, and then the uh, perlite and the iron grains. But if you cut it now parallel to the rolling direction, polish and take a look at it, you see that this, look and, uh, this, this, this manganese sulfide inclusions are really a long, uh, like a worm, extending hundreds of microns into the, into the iron. In fact, there are about 3,000 or 4,000 of them per square millimeter in a given normal iron. You get rid of this manganese sulfide inclusions, you will have huge milestones, you know, covered in terms of protecting iron from pitting. So they are uh, stringers. We call them stringers. They are running along the uh, parallel rolling direction, but only you see the tips like that. So let's corrode this thing. Let's just put this uh, sample nicely polished sample, uh, and then let's just uh, see what happens. So this is a marine corrosion. We are emulating uh, the uh, naval tanks. You have seawater on top of it. You store your uh, you know, fuel, and your tanks are made out of carbon steel, and their pipes are made out of nickel, uh, let's say copper nickel alloys. So. So this is a, and then we have microbes there, and we essentially expose the surface in a sur sometime inside a corrosive environment. Don't worry about the details. It's a biocorrosion. That's how things are in nature, uh, in fuel tanks, in naval tanks. Uh, you cannot prevent it. They are all over. So this is what it looks like, a shiny surface. It just doesn't look shiny anymore. This is about 50 days exposure. So now you want to analyze what the heck is going on, what kind of materials is about. This is just the surface. We don't even know what's happening underneath of this. So there are various multiple ways to approach. So we take an EDX spectra. That's your first line. You don't know anything else to do. Just go take an EDX. So what you see, what you see here, you see iron, nickel, copper, sulfur, oxygen, standard things we expected. And this nickel and copper is a bit surprising because we didn't know we were going to get that much nickel and copper because copper nickel is away from the sample, but it can essentially dissolve from there and land it on the system. Well, uh, what you do is you go very fast. You, you take this, what we call the EDX spectra. Some parts shows you pure iron oxide. Some parts show you various uh, minerals like sodium chloride and mackinawite and epitide and all these kind of things. And the other places show you copper sulfide and the... Uh, and uh, oxides of nickel uh, of, um, um, uh, and iron. So, so to be able to say that this is epitite or mechinovite, this takes a bit more than uh, just an EDX spectra. It's very difficult to do, to say this mineral composition. Elemental is no brainer. It just tells you. So you need experts like they here. You have to have familiarity with the mineralogy, with combination of various components of a given crystal, and you have to have uh, additional evidence uh, data to support. For example, I say this is a calcium carbonate, a calcite. Well, how about if it was calcium oxide? How I know that it's a calcium carbonate? So we have to now look at the next line of evidence. That's where, uh, and then you look at them like that. Uh, you know, this is false color. Uh, it doesn't come out like that. But you can see these microorganisms here. You can see this copper chloride, you know. I mean, it's like, it's like a war zone, and uh, you can see different microbes. These are, uh, uh, you know, uh, sulfur reducers. These are uh, aerobic organisms, all kinds of things you can see. And this is, uh, this, is where we are, this is where the trenches are lying. So here's another one. 
and iron oxide, different morphologies. You can sometimes tell something with iron oxide by simply from the morphology. But it takes experience. You have to do lots of these things. So copper sulfide, nickel oxide, and the sometimes elemental copper, you see these things. So let's see how we can tell that it was, say, calcium carbonate, not something else, or it was copper oxide, not elemental copper, oxidation state. So that's where the XPS come, comes in. So XPS is simple. You shine X-rays on your target. It's about a millimeter diameter. And then you analyze this energy, you know, kinetic energy of electrons from that you can get uh, elemental ion section. But you also get chemistry. Here is our XPS uh, spectrus, uh, spectrometer. There are X-rays are generated right here. This is our monochromator focused on a target right here. This inverted Chinese walk looking thing is our analyzer, spherical sector analyzer. So I'm just, uh, let me just review a little bit, uh, a couple of fundamentals. Uh, X-ray, uh, I mean, some of you are bored, but uh, some of you may not even uh, know what an X-ray photoelectron means. You send an X-ray to a fixed energy, in this case, aluminum K-alpha, monochromatized 1,487 EV. It gives all of its energy to this uh, atomic structure here, uh, it's a silicon, actually, uh, an electron in a, one of the shells. So it takes it up to this level here. The length of this arrow is the same as this arrow. This is called the photoelectron. It goes out. These are the sharp peaks. But as I said earlier, the system is very efficient. Unlike our government, it immediately stab you know, stabilizes itself. It immediately takes care of this problem. It fills this hole within 10 to the minus 13 seconds. And in doing that, it can generate an X-ray. But half of the time, we don't teach this thing in physics. And I don't understand why we don't. Half of the phenomena is Auger process other half is X-ray emission. So, so you shoot out another electron. They have a name, naming, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's adapted like first electron where you get the whole created called the L level, so it starts with L. Next electron that fills it here from the M level, M, and another electron goes out, it's the M electron, so it's LMM. And these electrons that are lost in this valence band is filled back essentially through the ground. Essentially, the system is neutralized immediately within 10 to the minus 9 seconds. That's how efficient uh, Otherwise, it will tell you because your spectrum will not work. So that's OJ, that's X-ray. So what you can do with XPS is basically uh, you can do, for example, let's look at, this is actually a fairly, fairly small, I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is a polymer, uh, it's a polyvinyl acetate. It's, important, it's not important what it is, but I'd like you to look at this molecular structure here. You see this carbon, carbon number four here, you may not read it, but I can, uh, I'm very close. It's a double bound to an oxygen. So lots of electrons sucked out of that carbon, it immediately shows where this core level of that line, it shifts down. So carbon, who loses electrons, shifts down in the uh, photoelectron uh, energy. Oxygen that gets the electron shifts up the other way. So you have oxygen in one position, and there's another oxygen which is single bound to a carbon in another position. So you can tell, you know, local chemistry. And similarly, carbon-4 is separated from carbon-3, which is singly bound to and oxygen. So you can tell the local, that's how you tell copper is copper one, or I mean, or, or zero, or copper two, whatever, you know, the oxidation states are told by looking at these, this is a overall spectra. This is oxygen, this is the carbon peak, this is the oxygen OJ, like OJ we were discussing, and they're all gonna show up in your spectra. So you have to know what they, what they are. And then when you look, zoom into them with the oxygen, you get this. You zoom in this carbon, you get this. So that's what kind of information. You can get the oxidation state of your uh, material of interest. So here is the spectra I took from that very complicated surface. And then I look at core levels. I'm not going to show them here. So I know exactly where sulfur is supposed to be. Is it the sulfide or sulfate? Sulfate is plus six. Sulfide is minus two. You know, there are huge differences. <laughs> So by looking at the core levels, I can tell it was iron sulfide or whatever else. So 
a copper sulfur. So that we, 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 that's how we tell. So you need this in other in a complementary data to be able to tell. Similarly with iron, similarly with nickel, copper, locations of oxidation states are different. That's how you can tell something is oxidized or elemental. We see a lot, a lot of elemental deposition on, the, on our corrosion uh, product. I never in my life would have believed that I will have pure copper deposited on my you know, surface in a corrosion environment. I always thought they were oxidized. It's not like that. So that's why you can say that, hey, this is sodium chloride, this is iron oxide, iron sulfide, iron sulfide. You know, you can essentially from now on, uh, you know, confidently say, and then you can also uh, publish your papers because referees are very smart people. They, they catch these things. And you can also say that this is copper, uh, calcium carbonate because this carbon interacting with oxygen is shifting way down in energy. So you can tell this carbon, this carbon from the carbon associated with biomass, bacterial uh, uh, These Most of the carbon associated with the bacteria is the carbon-carbon. Yeah, they are just uh, 284.5 EV. But that one is going to be 289. I mean, don't worry about the numbers I'm shooting out, but <coughs> we can tell. So now <coughs> we have all this biomass, but our main objective was what is going on under that corrosion mass? Because it was camouflaged with all these products, and I want to know how my iron is being eaten away. You know, I want to see the skeleton of iron. So when you remove them, you can etch them away with some sort of, uh, you know, what we call Clark solution, some sort of acid. It doesn't touch iron, it just removes the corrosion product. So that's what it looks like. Like a bomb exploded there. Now you can see this is a perlite feature here. Every iron in between the two layers, uh, lamella, lamelli, I think, is eroded away because those iron that this was initially a very solid material. This is a carbide, and next one to it, what looks like a hole that used to be iron there. And strain. So iron likes to choose freedom, go wander in the solution as an iron, iron rather than stay strain, even if it's not living. Freedom is what they choose. Minimum gives free energy. So strain means corrosion, and that's universal. We discovered this, actually. Uh, we just sent it for publication. So here is another example. This is a manganese sulfide inclusion. Remember I said any time you have impurity, it strains the local environment. So it starts pitting away. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> you can see there's a pit evolving. And when you look at the <coughs> EDX, sorry about that, uh, you can see manganese and sulfur, you know, manganese sulfide, equal amount of sulfur, equal amount of manganese. And the, um, you can see iron because EDX really is not localized here. It takes information from the surrounding. Scattering essentially goes up here, it sends an X-ray from the surface. So it's not very uh, local. Uh, in terms of image, in terms of image, highly um, uh, resolved, but in terms of spectroscopy, it's not resolved. You get information from the walls here. And the, uh, here's another example. Now, this is, uh, again, uh, corroded surface. Again, here is a manganese sulfide. I have two messages with respect to this uh, graph. Actually, maybe three messages. First of all, if you use electron beams about 1 keV in your imaging, you get very high resolution. Very surface uh, details can come out. But you don't see deep holes. So this is a 1 keV image. You don't see anything. What is beneath here? Here is something sticking out. And this is a magnet sapphire stringer. And then you change it to 20 keV. Use backscatter. And now you can see inside of it. So this is the same hole, but taken in a different keV. So <coughs> remember this, <coughs> this trick. <coughs> So that's one message. The other one is <coughs> you can take a spectra from point A on the surface here. You can take another spectra from the bottom here of this pit. The blue is A, spectra A, taken from this location. Yellow is the spectra taken from the bottom. We, we are the only one that discovered this, published this last year, I think. Comparing the two spectra, we can now tell you how deep this narrow pit is. Turns out it is out that this was six micron deep. So it's another uh, uh, method. 
here, uh, you know, for six micro, maybe it's not impressive, but look at that. These are the similar type of, you just wait a bit longer, then this, wherever there was manganese sulfide, you have deep pits evolving, essentially they will coalesce together, they'll make bigger peaks. But the point is that this is a 35 micron. Try to measure this thing with any other technique that you can tell me you can measure it. I'll bet my best shoes that you, nobody can measure this. This is how we do it. You take a spectra from the surface, <coughs> you take a spectra from the <coughs> bottom of the pit, you know the absorption coefficient of the uh, X-rays at that energy, and you compare it, you can get the depth. So that's something they published. Anyway, uh, the people out there, if you, you want to know, we can lend you our software. You can have this thing part of your SEM analysis uh, you will get this kind of information within seconds once you get the data. All you need is two spectra, one from the bottom, one from the top. Software, you feed the data, within a few seconds you will get that information. So a couple other um, uh, tricks that I would like to mention here. <coughs> Sorry. So this is, um, again, whenever there's strain, this is uh, our perlite feature, it's corroded away, it starts digging a hole and suddenly this is the surface polished parallel. So manganese stringers are running underneath the surface parallel to the surface. Here we unearthed a manganese sulfide inclusion and hole is following into the material along the manganese sulfide inclusion. But the point of this is that if you look at this spectra I took from this manganese sulfide, you see the manganese here and you see the sulfur peak. Sulfur peak is now very small. This will happen to you when you do analysis. Says my low energy X-ray peaks don't look as good as it should have been. Well, here is an example. The reason is very simple because you are in a hole. My detector is up here towards this corner. They for this uh, these are low energy X-ray. For them to go to detector, they have to go through this wall of iron to so absorb. Absorption is not uniform. High energy manganese, uh, you know, K uh, alpha peak goes a bit faster, less absorption. So you see a bit bigger of this and less of this will happen to you more often than not. So you just have to be very careful with it. Here's another thing that uh, the data, this is again parallel surface. You have this manganese sulfide inclusion running parallel to the surface, hundreds of microns. But I have here a large view of this here and another one here. Look at that, manganese sulfide is broken right here, and here broken at this location and at this location. So what happened that when these, uh, during the metallurgical processing of this material, these manganese sulfides are just produced as a, as a process of, I mean, as a, uh, as a metro, metallurgy, and, and then so they are hugged with this, with this iron matrix all the way through. So when the corrosion preferentially removing the iron around that because that's where the most strain is, is suddenly uh, free of that iron that was hugging it and then it snaps. In fact, it snaps so hard that it, this alignment is broken right here. So this is another thing, the release of stress you can see as a result of removing mm -hmm. of the material. So you can see all kinds of information. These are, these are spin-offs. We didn't expect, <laughs> we didn't expect to see this kind of data, but you know, so let's talk about uh, surface sensitivity. So, so far I show you EDF data and they are always bulk. But was there anything on that surface that I missed in my analysis? Wow, that was a good question because I'm glad we asked that. This is our nano OJ uh, volt, so to speak. This is a sound, light, thermal isolation. It's a thick wall. I mean, it's a heavy, uh, heavy, heavy enclosure. It's just being installed upstairs. When you look inside, that's what you see here. This is our sophisticated system here. <coughs> Essentially, <coughs> what you have there is, again, fill emission electron gun, focus the one nanometer beam here, just, just like any other field emission microscope. But on top of it, you have in constant concentric with that um, uh, optical elements, you have this um, cylindrical mirror analyzer that analyzes the energies of the electrons. So now you have additional, you require ultra-high vacuum for that. So this is a field emission microscope. You can 
put an EDX detector, which we have in this system, uh, we will have it, it's being installed, and you can put EDX detector, which we will have it in this one, but on top of it, you have a sputter gun here, you have obviously second electron detector, so you can do imaging, so this is a sophisticated field emission SEM and some. Essentially, uh, it's a total analysis of a sample. It requires a little bit of um, uh, learning. So usually, OJ electrons are like this one here. This is this particular peak, argon peak here. This is a silicon OJ. Don't worry about details of it. But it runs on a background like that. So you take a derivative of this background. So you get here is the silicon, one of the silicon OJ peaks. Another silicon OJ. They come. In, in various pairs and, you know, many, many different signatures. So when you see one of them, hey, what kind of OJ is it? You have to look at the other ones as well. Essentially, these OJ electrons are fixed kinetic energy. No matter how you generate a core hole, you throw a rock, you throw an X-ray, throw an IMB, whatever you do, positions of these OJ electrons are fixed in kinetic energy. So um, this is another very important uh, uh, graph that I would like to emphasize. Let's, let's just compare quantum yield of OJ yield versus uh, X-ray yield as a function of periodic table, essentially, you know, the Z of the element. You can see for low Z, like oxygen, carbon, boron, whatever, there is not too much X-ray generated. Yield is way down there, whereas OJ has 100% yield all the way across any element you can choose. So in this system, we can do X-ray to see what's underneath. You can do OJ, what's on top, at the same time, at the same location. And we can see even more than that. I'll tell you what else we can do. But that's the system coming up that's unique. It's <coughs> unique. It's the only system that I know. There are OJ nanoprobes around, but this is a custom build. We have additional detectors. It's the only one in the country, maybe in the world right now. Just letting you know. I'm watching that. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. So, so now, <clears throat> so let's see what it can do. See, let's see the power of this thing. Here is a polished surface, and we take an, uh, we take a EDX spectra from here. Here is the uh, uh, um, EDX. It tells me it's a manganese sulfide, and there's some iron because it's inside an iron. And there's this nanoparticle. We don't know what it is. And now we take OJ from the same location in this the green uh, square, wow, what we see, we see copper in addition to everything that EDX said. I never knew there was a copper there. We've, we've been working with this thing for two years. In the life of me, I wouldn't have been imagined there was copper there. And then we map. You know, that's something that we do quite a lot. It's a fast mapper. You can do a nanoscale mapping. It's a spectacular. So we map iron. Okay, so there's more iron and less in the uh, uh, manganese sulfide. That's expected. Manganese, it should be there. It's manganese sulfide. Sulfur, it should be there, no problem. Copper, it shouldn't have been there, but it's there. <laughs> I see copper right there. And in fact, this, this location right here has more copper. Like here is something like, you know, in this corner, more copper there. And then this little one turned out to be a silica particle left behind from our polishing. So you, can, you see the resolution now. The whole thing is one micron, uh, smaller than the size of a bacteria. Sometimes bacteria is too much. And you can get this kind of resolution. That's what we have upstairs. So I wouldn't have, you know, we spotted this thing. Two nanometer later, there was no copper left on the surface. So it's very important if you're doing electrochemistry, if you're doing surface chemistry, you know, that, 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 that's, that's very important information. You know that it is there or not. So it was there. I don't know why it was there. I don't, it was there. But then other, you know, other things you can do. Here is the manganese sulfide inclusion. These are essentially we are looking for. I said we are in a crime scene. We want to understand how the corrosion is taking place, elemental steps of the corrosion, all that. So this was briefly exposed to corrosive environment. And then here's the manganese sulfur, here's the iron, and we image the sulfur here. So, so it's the manganese sulfur, you will see sulfur. And you can see sulfur is getting less and less in the immediate surroundings. It's extending into the iron matrix. So that's like a dendritic structure right here. And then this was spotted about 10 nanometers, removed all the surface oxide from the surface. And we see a ring of oxygen around this manganese oxide surface. 
I mean, the, 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 the interface between the, um, between the iron and manganese sulfide. And that was a key. That's, that's, this is so important information. You cannot get this information with EDX. This is about 25 nanometer width here. We see an oxide. This oxygen comes from the water. This is essentially hydrolysis of the iron ions, and, uh, and it, it acidifies this region here, and then this oxygen from the water becomes part of iron oxide. And that's a key in understanding fundamental steps. You will see many of these kind of things in your analysis, but it depends on how you interpret your results. And we've been also, it's a bacteria, you know, we have here uh, CBE uh, people, when they are starved, they do all kinds of funny and crazy things. They store, you know, they, they, they store. So we were seeing this nano um, uh, spheres inside the belly of the bacteria. Here's the bacteria here. And these nanospheres, we have no idea what they were. We try very hard to kind of, uh, you know, get elemental information on them. So here it is with OJ. These are not done in our lab. It's done with the system we have, but we send them out. They were doing free, otherwise $800 an hour. Uh, but, uh, you know, we got them done because uh, we were essentially getting the system from them. So you can see they were phosphate. So what you do with that, I'll leave it to the microbiologists, but these organisms are storing something to survive the bad days ahead. So almost there. I still have. <laughs> so how about the structure? You know, so there are uh, what we call EBSD, electron basket diffraction. You know, you tilt your sample, you shine uh, uh, electron beam. There's a reason for that tilting. I'm not going to get into that. It's a very fundamental reason, actually. And then you have a camera here. You take pictures of like that, a bunch of lines. These are diffraction lights. We call them Kikuchi patterns, it's sort of dots, spots. You know, they're the same stuff. There's the bright, uh, you know, diffraction rule. And you see these lines, and they are very mature technology. Within milliseconds, we can interpret. We can tell orientation of your crystal. We can tell whether it's strained or not. We can also tell its phase within submicron area, sometimes even, uh, even smaller. And here it is. We just map a nicely polished iron surface. Here, the blue areas are 111 orientation, green ones are 101 orientation, red ones are 100 orientation. But, okay, so there are nice, pure orientation, but there are these things that they are uh, not necessarily pure colors, like a rainbow. That's where the strain. During the metallurgical processes, lattice has been strained, system didn't know <laughs> which way to go, and we can actually map where the strain is by simply taking a derivative of this picture. When you do that, here is a polished surface. Before it isn't exposed to the element, here is the derivative. Everything that's red, blue, whatever, is area that's strained. I can predict ahead of time that the system will corrode from these areas. I didn't have to do this uh, corrosion experiment. Well, let's see if this was correct. Somebody got a thesis out of that. And the, uh, here it is. You can see wherever there was red, this is the same area after several weeks of corrosion matching right one to one. And this is atomic force microscope image of the same area. We can tell the depths of these and we can actually tell, calculate the rate, compare it, and within four, four or five percent accuracy, it was identical. That's the power of analysis. So, uh, other things, uh, microbiologists, sometimes, you know, these are uh, center images here. You have to, um, you know, preserve the integrity of your soft samples. So you have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, do fixation, I mean, the critical point dry. The details of that I will explain another time or we can always ask me, but essentially when, essentially you have the water, you don't put vacuum on a wet sample, it will explode the bacteria. So you replace it with alcohol, then you replace it with the, liquid CO2, and then you essentially take it around the critical point and then essentially gently warm it up, and so your bacteria is nice and dry and then preserved. You see, look at these, you can actually see uh, all these nanowires and things of that nature. So that's what you do. And also, this is my last one. I still have fun. I'm almost there, I'm almost there. This is courtesy of Professor uh, Nakagawa Wataru from the Chemical Engineering. Essentially, 
not, making nanostructures, you have to use focused uh, electron beams. And they've been doing it in our uh, facility uh, for, for some time now. Here, this is the Montana written in, uh, about this scale. This is the one micro scale here. Huh? That's the smallest Montana you've ever seen. And these are the, these are the cross sections of the, some of the structures they make. It may not be you know, impressive, but you see this mushroom shape is very crucial in making uh, nanostructure uh, circuits and things like that. So each one of them is like a little mushroom. He was very proud of it. It doesn't uh, excite me, but it's, to him it was spectacular. The, the, uh, <laughs> it's almost there. And you can see, uh, you know, the way you do is you put a uh, uh, bunch of polymers on silica surface, and you shine. This is where electron beam comes in. Just this, rest is not us. You essentially you, uh, you break the polymer uh, chains of the PNMA here, and then you wash it away. If there's a little hole left, you have another chemistry, you run away, so you have this hole, you deposit aluminum on it, and then you remove that old uh, polymer, you deposit, essentially you etch it. And then you, when you etch it, the, underneath the uh, aluminum is survived etching, and then you remove the aluminum here, you have a step. This is a semiconductor technology. All these cell phones and everything goes through this kind of process. You put gold on it, and you have now a gold. So what do you do with this? Well, he's very proud. He says, this is a polarized array of prototypes. These are essentially applications in um, optics and semiconductors. All these spectacular phones and cameras and everything, they are essentially based on this kind of thing. So with that, uh, I'll uh, leave the, uh, uh, yeah, you have five minutes now. There. <laughs> Thank you, but we, uh, we are almost done. Well, let's give Richard a hand for that tour de force. You can uh, obviously uh, interrogate and torment your samples with any manner of beams. Today we talked about x-rays and electron beams. We also have particle beams, time of flight sims we'll talk about at another time. But there clearly is uh, a wide range of things that, that you can do. So I want everybody here and out in uh, the audience, uh, out in the world, to please consider your analytical needs and your imaging needs and think through the type, uh, types of materials you have and the opportunities you have to use this array of uh, microbeams to characterize the composition, the structure, the morphology, the chemical state, the composition, um, because uh, these tools are available to you. We are open for business. We are looking for collaborations, uh, both on campus, out uh, with our corporate uh, clients that we work with, and certainly with the uh, academic uh, groups that are uh, listening from uh, a distance. So uh, if you have uh, any follow-up questions, uh, well, we'll take questions here in just a second, but feel free to uh, send Recep or, or me uh, a note. Uh, the ITL webpage is here. And I think, uh, whoop, ah, what did I do? Can you? Can you quickly get me up again? I don't push anything. No. <laughs> I'm the techno idiot. There. There you go. Okay. I, just, I missed that. Yeah. So um, for those of you in the room here, we do have, um, we would like you to fill out a post-workshop survey. Carolyn Plum is our um, project evaluator. The online form is here. For those of you out in the world, we have the um, uh, link here. It'll just take you five minutes, but uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated because uh, we'd like to know what other topics you'd like to have covered, and if there's anything else uh, that we could add uh, to these seminars, uh, we'd appreciate it. So um, I'm going to push one more. Uh, thanks for your time, and why don't we take uh, any questions, and for those of you uh, at a distance, feel free to type in questions uh, on the chat as well. Okay. Any questions question. from the group? Uh, make rule out yourself. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. First. Uh, OJ, can you tell the, the chemical state of the XPS? Ah, limited. So the question was, can the OJ be used to, to ascertain the chemical state in a limited fashion. 
uh, it's not as clear as XPS, but you can, for example, differentiate, say, silicon oxide from silicon nitride, from silicon oxynitride, and just pure silicon uh, on the basis of their line positions, but it's not as clear cut as XPS. Good question, yeah. Dean, you had a question. So um, sometimes I'm looking for an impurity that gives me a color that ah. is very rare and hidden. And how many how many samples do I have to look at? How many pieces do I have to interrogate to try and find the rare? So uh, the question is, uh, he is looking at the um, trace elements that gives color. You know, so you have sapphire different colors. Well, first of all, you're in the trace element, zone, you know, zone there. So we, none of these techniques I show will be able to give you part per million type of, or, you know, maybe 10 parts per million. So you are in a different, and OJ will not help you. However, if it is, if it is a, like, say, 5 uh, micron or 5 nanometer or maybe 10 nanometer point concentrated, it won't give you too much uh, color maybe, but the point is that you can, you can determine trace of them by mapping and looking for, like, little blobs of your material. OJ is a very fast mapping technique, but if it is spread throughout the lattice in one, you know, color center here, another there, that's a different ball game. That yeah. game is a different ball game. Yeah, and I would just add, add that it all depends on the heterogeneity of your sample on different scales. So uh, as Richard suggests, it could be diffused throughout the volume, or you could have you know, centers that have organized themselves into a phase. You can probably see the phases. We can actually see them. That not, is not, not so much if, if it's distributed in a thin film. How many samples to look for? <laughs> Everyone is going to be its own mystery. And it's kind of like Alice through uh, the looking glass. But as you crawl in deeper and deeper, it gets curiouser and curiouser. Yes, sir. So is there a solution to the manganese sulfide strings that you showed? Ah, so that's the, that we have to ask yes. Uh, um, yeah, answer is yes. So that's uh, the frontiers of metallurgy. Now, they produce these uh, steel, carbon steel, using um, the, well, using this old technology. But there's a new technology. There's a direct um, reduction process being evolved continuously, and in the in advent of computers and control and this nature, the, the sulfur comes from the coke, the, the, uh, the coal. If you avoid using coal in reducing, you, know, you have these big chimneys and they put a bunch of, uh, you know, carbon there, a bunch of uh, uh, calcium, whatever, oxide or whatever, and the reduction process involves using a lot of carbon and the sulfur is in the carbon. So direct reduction can eliminate that. Uh, is it cost efficient and all that that has to be taken to account? Unfortunately, we have to live with it. If you uh, you know if you want the truth, the answer to that has been sought after many many years, but it's getting better and better. We have steels now that they didn't have ten years ago. So we're at the close of the hour. Is there maybe one more question? Anyone? Yes. Can you look at like disease-absorbed molecules? Of course. Oh, yeah. Of course. You yeah. speak our language. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so I mean, we can go from some. So, so the question uh, is, uh, can we look at fizzy-sorbed uh, components? Yeah. So, um, in fact, uh, one of the selling points of the OJ was I, I was, um, I was, um, we were doing uh, um, functionalization. In our case, it will, it will be chemisorbed, but it's the same thing. Um, uh, we have trace, I mean, the, the, the submonolayers of um, uh, nitrogen, you know, centers on uh, the fibers of glass. You want to know whether we have really uh, nitrogen it's amine groups on the glass surface. And they are, again, submonolayer. And, the, um, yes, we can see them. You can see them uh, in great detail. So answer is yes, but uh, details, 
uh, is where the devil lies. And, so and I'm just saying that Earth and Environmental Sciences, we know that some minerals like gothite and other iron, actually hydroxides are basically molecular sieves. And uh, some of the manganese actually hydroxides. And uh, there actually have been studies that have shown during the daytime and at night, there's actually absorption or release of components because of fertilizable uh, reaction uh, that are mediating the absorption. So uh, it's a brave new world out there. <laughs> All kinds of things to look at. OK, well, we're, we're over time. So I want to thank everybody for your attendance. Uh, we'll do this uh, about once a quarter with a different method, different part of the mock facility. Um, any follow-up that you want, uh, why don't you go back one slide just so they know how to reach it. There we go. Uh, send questions. And uh, again, we're looking forward to people coming up to the lab and uh, take our, uh, our tools out for a spin. Thank you. Okay, thanks. thanks.